speak can you hear me uh this is kirill aramenko so uh please type in uh, to the chat if you can hear and see me hopefully both <laughs> um let me know how how the audio video is going and as always while we're waiting for everybody uh, to join in let's quickly type in where we're from i'll read out where you're from it'll be good to uh, see who we've got here online today so all right so we got i think we've got a few people that can hear me and see me that's wonderful so i'll start i'm from brisbane australia <laughs> as most of the time um even though sometimes I'm not, uh, I'm not from uh, in Australia anyway. All right, there we go. So we've got uh, Thomas from Spain, Alan from North Carolina, Ravi from Toronto, Suhail, if I'm pronouncing it right, sorry if I'm wrong, uh, from Bangkok, first time. Welcome, welcome, great, great to see you. Paul from South Africa, no, non Lanha. Uh, again, hope that pronounced it right from South Africa. Daniel from Dallas, Texas. Cox Young from uh, Malaysia. And Tim from South Australia. Hey, Tim. <laughs> Tim is our um, regular here at ForexBot. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's, it's actually, it feels like a good time, right? So we've got people from all over the world. Uh, before, when we ran them on Thursdays, we didn't get people coming from all over the world. Now we get people from Australia, so we've got some people Australia, Asia, we've got South Africa, we've got America, so from Texas, uh, then we've got Toronto, Canada, wonderful. Um, so yeah, it looks like everywhere, except for Europe, but at the same time, Europe's the same time zone as, kind of like the same time, same time zone as um, South Africa, so more or less. So it looks like this is a good time which is great. So what has been going on with you guys? I uh, hope hope everybody is well and, and fit and healthy. Oh, there we go. Spain is in Europe. <laughs> Thomas, you're totally right. Spain is in Europe. Yep. So there we go. We got everybody from uh, all the continents. Um, yeah. Uh, what has been going on? I'm kind of like we're running this webinar a bit early. Uh, so this is uh, middle of the month. Usually we run towards the end, but this time middle of the month because finally after so after you know years of like no i wouldn't say years probably the last holiday i had was probably the last year when i think i went to china in april uh for a wedding but this time like i'm like all right time to take a holiday i'm going on a holiday for two weeks starting tomorrow <laughs> starting tomorrow uh to the philippines it's gonna be fun um gonna do some scuba diving there with some some sharks, yep, it's gonna be, it should be exciting. Um, anyway, so I decided to take a whole day, take a break, and that's why we kind of like put this in the middle so that we do have a webinar in September because I want you to come back in October. And uh, therefore, I do apologize if, if it's not ideal, you know, like uh, usually I prepare quite a lot, but here I, <laughs> I will definitely come back. Um, here, like usually I prepare a lot for these webinars, like, you know, spend at least half a day, or a day here I only had a few hours to prepare because I really had to um, cramp up a lot of stuff like I had that I had pending from my other business as well from uh, super data science so like putting a lot of stuff like you can't imagine what a mess this apartment is in like <laughs> looks pretty clean behind me that's because I pushed all the stuff forward um, and so yeah so I do apologize if it doesn't sound or look as professional as it normally does. But at the same time, we'll have a more of a practical session. So have some fun, like doing some practical stuff. So bear with me and hopefully we can have some fun along the way. Answering your question, Isabel, uh, we're in the Philippines going to Cebu. Uh, that's an island. And then from Cebu, it's like, I think it's a six hour drive by car up to Malapascal. And Malapascal is a um, diving resort where you can dive with thresher sharks. So if anybody's a diver, um, hit me up on the private Facebook group after this webinar. Or I mean, after I come back, I'll tell you all about it. Um, yeah, so you can dive with thresher sharks. These are sharks like they're, they've got this long tail above them and they swim up to fish very quickly and they stop and then the tail hits the fish and like um, paralyzes it and then they eat the fish. So it's pretty cool. Um, uh, so hell, if your picture is blurred, then try logging out and logging back in or try switching off all your other stuff because we've we've tried this out before usually it's on the person side who's listening to the webinar 
all right, so that's that's where I'm going, uh, Mal Pascal. And if you have any suggestions, throw them in the Facebook group as well, because I only have booked, like I've only planned out half my trip. I have another seven days in the Philippines in that area, which I don't know what I'm going to be doing, so it's going to be fun. Anyway, uh, great, that's great. Um, all right, we can talk more about the trip further towards the end. It's, uh, it's 10, 10, 10 past 10 in Australia, in Brisbane here. Uh, PM, of course, um, and I think we should get started on our uh, session. What do you guys think? Let's let's rock and roll, right? I think everybody who's wanted to join has joined. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Let me find um, what I want to share. I think this screen is the one I want to share. Okay, voila. All right. Oh, yeah, that's the logo for my other company. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, what did I want to bring up? So there we go. Uh, Forex boats. Trading Academy. All right. So today we've got an awesome, exciting, interesting webinar. We've got Ruby this time on our admin panel. So if you have any questions or the, something goes wrong, just type in Ruby will uh, help you out or she will ping me and I will get back into the chat. And today we've got a disclaimer. Congratulations, as always. We have to go through the disclaimer. It has to be displayed for at least five seconds because Forexport is a regulated company. So read through. Please do proceed with the webinar if only, only if and if only you agree to these terms. All right, so let's jump in. Plan for today. First of all, we're going to talk about market phases. So uh, we're going to see what kind of phases are possible in the market. What you know, what uh, what can happen and stuff like that. What uh, what to expect and what to look out for in your trading strategies. Uh, then we'll talk about a pra we'll have a practical session. So as I mentioned, this session won't have that much of a presentation side to it. It'll have more of an ad hoc practical session. I gotta stress it's gonna be ad hoc. So you will see <laughs> things go down like I'm not expecting them because I uh, this is not one of uh, like you know presentations. Sometimes people run online where they've like prepared some examples that they they know they want to find. We're going to be looking for random examples, so you know I want your participation. Uh, shout out if you want to, you know, if you got any ideas and stuff that you want to look at and stuff like that. And then we'll look at three indicators. So as promised, we're going to look at three different indicators that can help you identify different trends. And we're going to look at different complexities. I I, I guess I should say we're gonna. They're, they're going to be at different levels and different types. In reality, there's lots of indicators that can help you look, uh, find trends, not just trends, but market phases. But at the same time, I'm just going to give you like a th uh, three of them because this is something we talk about a lot, choice paralysis. I don't want you guys to get paralyzed by choice when you when I give you like 100 or when you have 100. We're just going to look at three. Three, some, like I wouldn't say they're too simple, I wouldn't say they're too complicated, but at the same time, they'll be interesting and something for you to explore further. And then at the end, we'll have a practical coding uh, session where we'll practice coding one of those indicators into an EA. And so don't expect any miracles from here as well. This is not gonna be an EA that's making tons of money and we're gonna make it make even more tons of money. Uh, this is just gonna be the, um, MACD sample expert advisor, which is which comes pre-packed from MT4. The co the purpose of this tutorial or this webinar is not to optimize an expert advisor. We have a whole course on that. The purpose of this tutorial is actually to just learn how to code these things into indicators and how into expert advice and how to think about the process. That's the focus. And so to quickly sum up, the first three parts of this session are going to be useful to everybody, everybody, whether you're a manual trader or algorithmic trader. And the last final part is going to be useful to those who are uh, coding. So we'll spend about 20 minutes on that. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you are an a manual trader and you have some questions you're gonna have to um, sit through those 20 minutes for coding otherwise uh, you know you feel free to jump out after we've done the indicators because from there it'll be just the coding and then we'll have the q a then so hopefully you're cool with that plan everybody cool all right let's get started all right so i'm gonna bring up the browser um so as you can see here i've already done a bit of practice, I guess, of what I want to explain today, but we'll start afresh. All right. So what are we looking at today? Today we've got a chart, right? So this is a chart. We're going to start off by trying to talk, uh, well, just by talking about market phases. Actually, I like it more when, when it's got something at the bottom. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about market phases, what to look out for, what kind of market phases uh, you can think of that exist, right? So 
the main four that I tend to identify and that like I, I think of are as follows. So we've got four market phase. We've got trends, we've got retracements, we've got impulses, and we've got flats. Actually, a better order is trends. I'm just gonna write this order down. <laughs> trends, retracements, uh, then we've got flats, and then we've got impulses. I think that's the proper order, better order. And oftentimes, people identify just three phases, just trends, retracements, and flats. I think impulses deserve their space. Like back in 2008, they weren't as prominent. Now impulses happen all the time, right? So this is a euro dollar hourly time frame. Let's see if we can identify a couple of these trends or a couple of these phases just to understand what we're talking about, right? So here, for instance, you see this going downward. That's called a downward trend. So that you obviously can see it right away. So the market's trending downwards, right? Let's have a look somewhere else. Um, this over here, when you can do something like that, Oh, by the way, t tell me if that train is noisy because I moved to a new apartment and there's, there's a train station outside. If I close the window, you can't hear anything. But at the same time, it's it's pretty hot to keep the window closed. So, But let me know if that's bothering you. Anyway, so that's a flat. When you can do something like that and you just... So what I did there is I, I held down control and I copied that line. That's a flat. Inside a flat, you might witness like ups and up and down trends. So you, somebody might call this a downward trend inside the flat, right? And that's normal because inside a flat, the market is like confined to a horizontal uh, channel and therefore it goes up and down. And so if you actually go to a different time frame, so if I go to the like one time frame down here or two time frames, M15, right? And, uh, Actually, I guess it's too far back in history. But if you go down a few time frames, you'll see that everything gets bigger, and therefore this will actually look like a downward trend. So this this uh, flat goes all the way up to here, in my point of view. Uh, let's uh, let's grab that. Um, Whoa, well, that's not <laughs> right. Well, you you get the point. Uh, the, this thing is not clicking for some reason. All right, there we go. So that that's a flat. Let's have a look uh, for an upward trend, yeah? So if you zoom out, so you, you can't really tell from here, but if you zoom out, like let's go to the daily time frame and go back inside, you will, or maybe four hourly daily is too, too far, too, dis too dispersed. So if you go out to, where is that stuff? There, so if you go out to the four hourly time frame, you can see that actually here, looks like we have a time we have an upward trend except for this bit over here this looks like an upward trend and if i copy that um this is interesting actually because sometimes it happens like this so this is a channel and this is the top of the channel here and then the um, price only gets to the middle of the channel there all right so we've got so far we've got trends examples flats right so now we want to have a look at a retracement. So what is a retracement? How do you identify a retracement? Retracement is like when you have a trend here, for example, you've got a trend, right? This is an overall trend going, um, or let's have a look at a different one. That, that was a bit extreme. Uh, ba -ba -ba All right, so here, for example, interesting types of market movements actually going on. Uh, here, you've got, you've got a trend going on it like this is a this is a two part trend very interesting it goes it it accelerates right so it go, it was going at this speed and then it like shot off and same thing actually happened here that's why i didn't really want to take this one you can see that this is this started off as a trend right and then it accelerated shot off really fast up over there so that's kind of like a trend of an acceleration very interesting to see those and what what you can see precedes this trend this acceleration part is a retracement so you actually, this is the first part of the trend. And then here you've got a retracement. And that that is basically what a retracement is. It's when within a trend you have um, uh, the price turning around and like going back a little bit, right? So I'm sure you guys are familiar with all of this. And the last uh, item that we want to talk about is impulses. So let's insert kind of like something else here. Uh, um, what do we want to, we want to shape like an ellipse? Whoa. When was the last time I drew an ellipse? It was ages. All right, there we go. So you can see that's that's a good example of an impulse, right? Out of nowhere, bam, up, and you can't do much about it, right? So it just just shoots off into into the sunset. 
very quickly. So impulses also have, they're quite prominent. So if you look around, you'll see impulse there, impulse there, impulse there, impulse. And this is the hourly, this is the four hourly time frame. So, you know, this impulse happened in uh, start of June. This impulse happened end of June, right? This impulse happened uh, January, February, March, 10th of March, then on the 16th of March, like just over a week later, you have another one. So impulses happen quite often. Back in the day, they weren't that prominent. Now they're happening more and more often. And so here you can see that just on this one uh, chart, I'm just going to quickly correct something. I've got this thing F flux, and it dims my monitor when night sets. And like I can't see, <laughs> see that well, especially when running a webinar. It's kind of like signaling me time to go to bed. But anyway, so here we can see we've got a retracement. We've got an impulse, we've got a flat, and we've got two trends over here just on this one chart. And so they come and go. And what you need to identify is for yourself, what are you going to look for in your trading strategy? Yeah, so it is it is kind of like a valid approach probably to look for multiple of these things like trends and retracements and try to capitalize on both for trends and flats and retracements. But personally, I think it is... Uh, Overcomplicating a strategy, it is better to just identify one of those items that you want to look for, whether it's flats in your trading strategy, or it's trends, or it's retracements, or maybe even impulses that you want to capitalize on, and just follow that one thing. And then, if you want to create another trading strategy, just create another trading strategy on something else, and then that way you'll have several trading strategies. So it's good to identify what you want to follow. And today we're going to look at. Uh, three indicators that will help us identify these things. So we're not going to look deal with impulses because personally, I think it's it's a waste of time trying to catch impulses. It's uh, they can happen randomly, and also when they do happen, you have to have very good execution and very good relationship with your broker for you to be able to take into uh, take these uh, impulses and actually use them in your trading because. Uh, very likely they're just going to happen so quickly that your orders are not even going to ex get executed. So what we're going to look at is how to identify, of course, trends. That's very important. We look at a bit about retracements and a little bit, a little bit about flats. And I'll just show you three indicators that, you know, that are quite common, but maybe we'll talk about some uncommon usages of these indicators or uses. All right, so let's get started. Let's um, let's go back to the hourly time frame. And the first indicator that I would like to discuss today um, is our just a simple moving average, right? So we won't stop at the simple moving average, but we'll talk about the moving average. Um, like we will evolve that conversation with a little bit more. So there's your moving average, simple moving average, let's say period 48, right? Again, uh, by the way, this is a tip. Like if you're gonna put an indicator on, a lot of people just put it on default like 14, right? Or you might maybe they'll double at 28, or might might be double at 56. Right. So why would you set it at some random number, right? If you're going to set it at some number, like a high number around 50, set it 48, for example. Why? Well, because 48, you're on the hourly time frame, and there's 24 hours in a day, so 48 actually means two days. And so it kind of like it gives it more meaning. You're averaging out your close prices in this case, but over two days or two yeah two consecutive days of data rather than 56 which is kind of like a bit random it's two days and eight hours what does that even mean not much right so um that's why like i prefer setting a a number like that and also by the way if you haven't checked out our webinar on super smoother definitely check it out because why would you use the moving average if you can use the super smoother i've got it up here and you just put it at so instead of four, instead of 48 uh, super smoother, we double it, right? So we set it at 96. Let's oh, and, and maybe let's just put the inputs just color like like a yellow or like a gold or something. And you can see that there we go. There we've got a super smoother indicator, which is actually better than the moving average. Um, that's just like a side note. I'm I'm going to delete the super smoother. We go. We're going to keep talking about moving average because we're going to evolve it into a conversation about MACD just now, and we don't have a MACD for the super smoother. But at the same time, if you want to limit yourself to the moving average, then uh, for sure uh, swap it over for the super smoother. So with the moving average, what can you see here? Well, uh, here you can see that it's kind of like going with the trend and uh, going with like the price and so on. Here it's kind of going down. But what happens if I increase this period? So let's say 96 for the moving average. 
uh, you'll see, start seeing interesting things. You'll see that whenever there's like an upward trend, like you see here, the price tends to bounce off the moving average. So it uses the moving average as a um, either resistance or support level. So here you can see off we go, the trend has started, some flat, flat, flat part, and then bam. And actually, if I extend this line, you'll see that the bam part happened as we crossed you know you had a flat previously so they come in hand in hand you had a flat previously it was in a channel the price crossed this flat the top border and bam is shot off so you can see this shooting off part and then like it try to go back moving average try to go back moving average try to go back moving average and then cross the moving average and never looked back right went bam then hit the moving average again went down then you got you had a bit of like a hiccup here uh, like I say, those things don't count. Um, but in reality, if you're, especially if you're coding expert advice, that's going to screw screw up your algorithm a little bit or your profits. And then bam. Then here, like you can see that the price kind of adjusted itself. It's no longer uh, respecting this 96 moving average, just going up and down, however it likes. But maybe it's respecting like a, I don't know, 96 plus 12. What does that give us? 108. Nope. All right. So let's try it. Just randomly 130. So you can kind of like see that there is a pattern. So, so 150 moving average, you can see it bounced off here. There's a bit of an impulse here, but then it bounced off. So basically with these moving averages, uh, the way to look at them is whenever a pri the price is above the moving average, you've got a trend, right? An upward trend. Whenever the price is below a moving average, you got a downward trend, right? So that's how they work. And then the moving average counts. If you find the right moving average and it acts as a like we had here, or let's maybe look for this one as well. Um, so you can see here, you can obviously see here that it crosses, it crosses, it crosses, it crosses, so and it crosses. So probably there's a moving average which will like sit right on the tops of these um, of these uh, like times when the price tries to cross. So here not so much, but here it start it touches there, touches there, touches there. So if you find the right moving average, it'll act as a support or resistance line. So that's just like just using one moving average. And already you can use that to tell you whether you're inside a trend or not. And that's kind of the basics, right? So we want to we want to add a bit of a layer of complexity to that. So how about we throw in another moving average? As you'll see, this this um, uh, webinar is going to get complex very quickly. So uh, we'll say 150. And whoops, let's change this to like, uh, oh, that's going to that's gonna be very hard on the eyes so let's say like a chocolate color so you can see here now all of this is kind of getting in the way slowly but here you can see we've got two moving averages you can see that obviously the faster one so 150 is always going to be closer to the price than the slow one right because um, the faster one is more sensitive to the price movements it takes into account less like period so let's say the blue one from here, from this point, it'll take 200 bars into account. So where am I? So it'll take, there we go, exactly 200 bars, that much into account. The, the chocolate one will take 150 bars. There we go, so that much. So therefore, that extra weight that the blue one is carrying will slow down. That's where the uh, chocolate one will be closer to the price. And so here, well, the way you would use two moving averages is you would look at them when they're crossing, when the faster one is closer to the price, then you would say, okay, that's a downward trend. Like when the faster one is lower than the, you can't even forget about the price here. When the faster one, the chocolate one here, is below the slower one, it's a downward trend. When the chocolate one is above the slower one, it's an upward trend, right? Basic stuff, I'm sure uh, all of you guys or uh, have either heard of it or already know all of these things. This is this is very simple stuff, right? The only problem here is like you get things like that when they cross over a lot and then it's a flat and but you're making trades and you're losing money. So okay, that's the basic stuff. Now how about we throw in a MACD indicator and see what what that tells us and how that is uh, how that works here together. So I'm going to throw in a MACD indicator and. Um, and just for fun, we're going to use the same same moving average, 150 and 200. So fast one, 150, slow one, 200. Be careful here. It says EMA, exponential moving average. They have a different um, way of being calculated. So they're not exactly these ones. You've got to correct these ones to exponential. Because simple is like just a simple exponential, exponentially weighted. Um, it Like from a mathematical perspective, they do have a difference from a 
signal processing perspective, no big difference. Like I've seen, I've seen reports, I've seen um, papers, white papers that are called uh, about this re researching this stuff. Really, the the exponential smoothing on a moving average doesn't add that much accuracy to the moving average. It's much better to go with a super smoother. In fact, for those of you who are coding, here's here's a here's a exercise. You know, because I know in our club in the forex boat um, club in on Facebook, we've got a lot of people coding stuff and putting out there. Like, um, uh, who 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 can I remember? Uh, Eli, Eli uh, puts up a lot of stuff. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that, mispronouncing that uh, wrong. And uh, like a couple of people have posted things on uh, the Facebook group. So if you um, are a coder and you don't don't know what to do next, try try coding a moving MACD, so moving average convergence divergence for a super smoother, right? Uh, so called SCD indicator, and share it on the group, and then we'll have one of these for the super smoother. All right, so what can we say here? What can we see here? The MACD indicator, just forget about the red line for now. What does it do? It, it calculates the difference between the two indicators. So you can see here they cross, right? And so the MACD is zero. And the MACD always subtracts um, the value of the fast uh, moving average from, no, the, the, it'll take this one as the first value minus the slow moving average. So in our case, the chocolate line minus the blue line. And so you can see here, this hump of the MACD means that there's an extremum. So you can't really see it here, but that's the maximum in the distance between the two. And here again, you can see the distance between the two uh, increases, and therefore the MACD increases as well. And so that's how the MACD indicator works. It's uh, it's pretty cool. It's, just like, it's like a shortcut, so you can actually see two moving averages uh, working together in this one indicator. And so how can you use the MACD indicator? Well, there's like probably a couple of dozen ways that you can use the MACD indicator to look at trends and look for trends and uh, more importantly, understand when trends are coming to an end and things like that. So obviously, uh, what we talked about, when the chocolate one is above the blue one, that is an upward trend, right? So here you can see upward trend. And that is when the MACD is above. So here you can see it's kind of like hard to tell, is there a crossing over here or not? But if you look at the MACD, no, there isn't a crossing. So all of this, when MACD is above the zero line, that's an upward trend, there, right? When the MACD starts to go below the zero line, downward trend. And so once you like look at the MACD and the chart like this for maybe, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 minutes like that, your eyes start to get used to it and your brain starts to get used to it. And so you can actually just, you mostly focus on the MACD and you're like, oh, okay, downward trend, upward trend, downward, down, upward, downward trend downward, down, upward, and so on, upward trend. And the big, the higher the humps in the MACD, the stronger the trend, the faster it's going. And that be why? Well, because that means, let's compare, let's compare, let's compare. So here, for example, you can see that this hump is higher than this hump. That means that the MACD here, or the slow, the fast moving average is much uh, higher than the slow moving average, whereas here is just a, like not much higher, it's just higher, right? So the difference is greater here, and that means because the fast moving average is more sensitive to the price, that means that the price is moving quicker than it used to. So um, the, these bars weren't moving as quickly, so the upward trend wasn't moving as quickly. And you can tell, you can see this impulse here, and it contributed, and some other bars contributed to this difference. You can see it tell, what it says is that the most recent bars have been moving in the direction of the trend quicker than the ones previously. So the slow moving average hasn't caught an up yet, whereas the fast moving average has. And here you can see that the trend, so then the trend is slowing down, then the trend is speeding up. So this MACD indicator is great for reading trends because it combines uh, two sources of information. And what I wanted to show you is how do you use the MACD indicator to identify when the trend's coming to an end, right? So. Um, an interesting way of using it is not just looking at, all right, so the price, is like MACD indicator is slowing down, or MACD indicator is slowing down. So that, yeah, that's a signal that, you know, some something's coming up. But an interesting way of using the MACD indicator uh, is you compare the humps. You look at the humps. So you're like, say, you know how you can create like a channel on your price? Well, you can do the same here on the MACD indicator. And so you just take two humps and you put a, a channel through them or like a, a trend line through them. And whenever you see that the consecutive um, hump on a MACD indicator is lower, 
that means the trend was faster here then it kind of like slowed down which is natural you know every trend is natural for a trend to have retracement so you had a trend going up then you had a retracement then the trends going up then you have a retracement but when you see stuff like this when the trend re reignites but it's not as strong the mcd's law that might be a signal that the trend is coming to an end that it's like depleting itself then you see this hump it's not it doesn't fall in with this line right it does if you continue the line it won't fall in exactly but if you draw another line you can see here um that it's lower so you know you can either decide that the trend has ended over here where uh, the MACD has become negative, or you can see that all of this, it depends, it's a matter of perception of how you uh, treat it. You can see it all as a long trend over here, and then you can see that it's slowing down. And then finally, this, like in my view, the way I would treat this situation is I would say, okay, all of this is one trend. Well, you can break it up kind of like into two there and there, but if you look at the bigger picture, this is one trend, and then over here, it turned around. And if you look at the MACD, you can see that the humps slowly consecutively started getting lower and lower. Um, so let's have a look. Let's just, so that we don't clutter this chart up, let's open a new one. And here, let's do MACD again. But let's use, let's say the def defaults, or not defaults, let's say 48 and uh, 96. I'll draw that. And here, so you don't even have to draw the moving averages. You can like already start thinking about just the MACD. Um, let's have a look. Let's say, something uh, where do we have like I want to I want to find like maybe a downward trend or something okay so here right so here like a, a very I wouldn't say a very prominent downward trend but something right we've got something something is going on here so you can see this channel right so we, we can clearly see from the chart that the start of the down like here it was kind of going up then the start of the downward trend is here and is here then it goes back up over here. So what does the MACD tell us in this situation? Well, let's have a look at the MACD. So what we want to find out, will we be able to see from the MACD indicator that uh, the trend started somewhere here and oh, let's see, that started over there and ended over there? What does the MACD tell us? Well, here you can see like upward and then bam, down, right? So the MACD actually tells us that if you're looking at the MACD, you'd be like, all right, Let's close that. Look at the MACD, you'd be like, all right, so uh, downward trend starts over somewhere here. Then you can see there's a like kind of a hump here. Then it becomes greater, right? So that's the trend accelerating. And then it becomes less, and then again less, right? And then again less. So that's a good indication or an indication that the trend is slowing down. And indeed, the trend ended. So after that happened, just a few more bars. So this is already time frame. 50 uh, is this yeah 58 hours so just over two days uh, and then the trend ended and it went the other way okay so that's that's a good example um, uh, of the tr of trend slowing down let's have a look at another one what do we have here so let's just start off the MACD I guess this time do the opposite so there's the trend starting and there's the trend ending based on the MACD right so this is like post factum we can see it went up went up, trend accelerating, and then went down. So it's still an upward trend. So if you exit here, it, it's still, you haven't lost that much. It's like, it's still going kind of like up, well, not exactly up, it's starting to go down. But over here, it was going up. But you can already tell from here that the trend is depleting itself. All right, so that's kind of how you would, one of the ways to identify trends and when they end. So it's also important to identify when things end. And so I don't want to rush through the rest of the stuff. So let's start slowly moving to other indicators. Another good one that I like a lot, and one of my favorite tools, and we have a whole webinar on this stuff. So if you like what we're going to talk about now, then check out that other webinar on Fibonacci stuff. Um, what we want to do is draw the Fibonacci retracement. So just to show you again, this button over here, draw Fibonacci retracement, if we draw that, if you have a trend, right? Uh, you drag it from the start to the finish. Actually, this is not the best example because there wasn't that much of a retracement afterwards. Um, so I want to show you that the Fibonacci retracements help you identify retracements. So let's maybe look at another chart, British pound dollar. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Bum, bum, bum. All right. Okay, so let's say, like again, I haven't prepared anything 
about this. So this is all random stuff. So let's say we start, we can see that something started here, like a trend, whoop, that trend, right? So let's just see, right? So if that's our start of the trend, that's our end of the trend, right? So let's just see how long this retracement was, right? So up to here, or maybe up to here. We'll give ourselves a bit of a bit of room. So let's see how deep it went down. So if I drag the Fibonacci retracements onto this, right? There we go. So what do we have? So there was a trend, went all the way up, started going down. Um, let me just make this a bit. That's not the one I want. This one. That's too much. So here, trend went up this way and then started going down and this red line so this red line kind of like bounced off the 50 line so this is this is half of that and the second one bounced off the 61.8 percent so um you can see here this line actually just got to the 61.8 percent and then started going back up so retracements it's very interesting because if i put like if let's let's move this about around a little bit let's say I've seen only this much of the chart, right? I've only seen this and I can see that something is going, so I can see that uh, it's the trend has occurred, so I can only see up to here. And so the retracement is starting. I can see that, okay, retracement has started. I wanna see how far it'll go. I wanna predict how far it'll go. I'll just drag the movie, the Fibonacci retracements from here to here, right? Um, from the start to the end of the trend. So I don't even know how far it'll go, but I can, it's very, uh, very common that you, traders would bet on the 61.8%. And if you go further down, la, 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 you can see that the trend actually, um, the retracement actually got just nearly up to this bit, not, not, not exactly up to this bit, and then it turned around and went over that way. So that, what, how is that helpful? Well, you can kind of like look at when the retracements start, and if you want to trade the retracements, then use the, you can use the Fibonacci to say, oh, oh, actually I know when I wanna get out of the market, just before it hits the 61.8%. Or if you don't wanna trade the retracements, you look at that, you see the retracement started, and you think, okay, if there's gonna be a trend, if the trend's gonna continue, when is it going to continue? Well, uh, it's gonna continue probably very, not very likely, but um, somewhat likely that it's gonna continue at the 61.8% mark. So you can re-enter the market at 61.8% and catch an additional bit of this movement. So that's pretty much how you use the Fibonacci retracements. Again, check out the webinar we have separately on this because you can go into a lot of depth on this topic. Um, the good news for you manual traders out there is that Fibonacci retracements are very hard, um, very hard to get, uh, very hard to code into algorithms, right? So um, you kind of really need a machine learning type of algorithm to identify where this bit is and this bit is without using your eyes, right? So for a machine, it's very hard. It might confuse this with this or this or this. So it's a very sophisticated type of algorithm that's going to properly identify the extremums where you want to create the Fibonacci retracement. And therefore, if you're manually trading, Fibonacci retracements are a great advantage which algorithmic traders don't have unless they're very, very, into their code unless they're very sophisticated and it takes a lot of time to code something like Fibonacci retracements into an expert advisor. So there you go. Definitely check that out. If you're a manual trader, check out the Fibonacci retracements, very handy tool. All right. And next is a tool that I like as well. All right. So let's, um, let's open a new chart again. Let's do Euro for example. And here, um, all right, so let's say you want to trade the euro dollar, uh, let's say hourly time frame, and you want to let, let's say you want to identify: Are we currently? Is this is this part of an upward trend or is this downward trend? What is going on here? Um, how, what, a, what like what to expect from the market? Well, a good kind of way to think about it is: Why don't we look at the higher time frames, right? So uh, we've already actually touched on this a little bit. If you look at the higher time frame, so this is the daily chart. Like for instance, on the daily chart, you can see that this is a downward trend, right? So this, you can obviously see that this whole bit is an accelerating downward trend like that, voila, right? Uh, but then let's look at this bit over here, just this part in, in specifics. Uh, 
specifically, specifically. Um, so I'm going to insert a shape, an ellipse over here. Oh my God, these ellipses are the hardest thing to draw. All right, so here you can see that this part, even though it's a downward trend overall, this part is going up, right? So it's it's obviously going up. So what does that mean? That means if I switch to a lower time frame, let's see if we can find that uh, that bit that I just drew. Nope, not this way. Uh, not enough on my chart. Not enough da data on my chart. Um, anyway, so is, is that right? Let me have a look again. Yeah, I guess I guess so. Yeah. All right. So anyway, the point is. If you look at that part on your daily time frame, this part over here that we just outlined in the ellipse, um, what's going on here is that the chart is actually going up. So when you go to a lower time frame, when you go down to the hourly time frame, if you're trading an hourly time frame, you might think this is an upward trend. And you know, it lasted 10 days. So yeah, on an hourly time frame, that's 240 hours, 240 bars. Yeah, that's quite a lot of bars. That's that's that that's how many bars more than how many bars fits on your screen at this level of zoom and so you can totally you might totally mistake this for an upward trend and you might actually trade it but it's often a good idea to check the higher time frame to see if you're an upward trend or in a downward trend so it can guide you and that is uh, a handy handy kind of trick like a lot of traders kind of ignore the up, uh, higher time frames, but they are very good for checking what is the overall movement on the market. And you know that rule that we kind of like follow, try not to trade against the trend because statistically you have more chances of making a profit if you're trading with the trend, when you think about it, right? So if there's a trend, like uh, like if there's a river flowing downstream, right? F river flowing downstream. Uh, that, and then there might be little currents in that river that are floating upstream, but they're temporary, right? Eventually they get con consumed and they keep flowing downstream. So just from a statistical perspective, you're more likely to make a profit if you're trading with the trend. That's why the saying, uh, don't trade against the trend, unless you are you know, super pro and uh, you have a specific strategy on identifying uh, retracements in the market. So use the up, higher time frame to find out the trend and so now i'm going to show you an indicator that can help you do that again there's heaps of these indicators but i'm going to show you one i like bollinger bands um so if you set it by default it's at 40 deviations at two i i'd probably set it at 40 uh, it's a 20 deviation to uh, if i would set it at 40 uh 40 so there's 20 there's okay there's five working days in a week we're on the daily time frame five working days in a week 40 um what does I mean? Eight weeks, right? So two months, approximately two months of, a bit less than two months of working days. Um, that's why the 40 deviations, uh, that's how many standard deviations uh, you're going to be using in this Bollinger Bands. So if you're not familiar with the Bollinger Bands, the way it works is, um, so Bollinger Bands, how does it work? The Bollinger Bands, let me just get rid of this stuff. The way it works is it puts a moving average in the middle Right, so you can um, see that's the period of the moving average. It's just a simple moving average. So if you if you overlay, let's give this a go. Um, if we overlay a simple moving average of period 40, it fits exactly as you can see. Let me just change this maybe to red. It fits exactly in the middle of the Bollinger Bands, right? So let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of it now. Uh, or we can even keep it, doesn't matter. Uh, no, I can get rid of it. <laughs> and then uh, actually what I like doing is doing this. So here you got the Bollinger Bands, that's a moving average. And then the way this is constructed, the bands themselves are very smart. So you've got you've actually got the envelopes indicator, which is similar. It, it takes a moving average and then it puts uh, puts another moving average above it and below it. So maybe let's get, get rid of the Bollinger and I'll show you the envelopes quickly. Take the envelopes. Uh, so let's say put a period of moving average 40 and deviation is 10. Oh, well, that's not a good a deviation. That's a hundred. That's not a good deviation. I don't, you can tell, I don't use the envelopes indicator much. Um, wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, that's objects list, indicator list. That's the only way to get rid of it. All right, let's do that again. Um, envelopes 40, let, I don't know, 50. Let's see what happened. No, bad idea. <laughs> okay. Not good with the envelopes. Basically, what the envelopes does, I'm going to give it another go. Uh, let's zero point um, point eight. There we go. So what the envelopes does is 
uh, it takes a moving average, but then it actually goes up and down from the moving average equidistantly. And as you can see, these bands, they're they're not they're not changing. Uh, they're like con it's like a corridor, a constant corridor. Um, and I, I don't know where this other color upper band lobe. Okay, so you just see the two bands. So you gotta you gotta I guess you gotta put in the moving average. So there's the moving average, and there's the two bands in between uh, that that go up below and above, right? And so they're equidistant. They're always at the same distance and that's not really fun why because market volatility changes and that doesn't account for market volatility so you can see here like markets not really volatile yep it's inside and then market goes crazy and then envelopes is is not is useless so that's why bollinger bands let's talk about bollinger bands bollinger bands these bands are standard deviations they're, they're the distance between the simple moving average and the how far away your uh, bands are so if you take it vertically right so it's always like vertically so from here up to here and below here it's measured in standard deviations and you are setting how many standard deviations so here we've said we want two standard deviations that's how far we want the upper band and lower band to be and you can read more about it but basically a standard deviation is a measure of volatility it will tell you uh it it takes into account how volatile the market is so basically how crazy are these bars? How large are these bars? And if they're large, the Bollinger Bands will expand to take that into account. So you won't end up getting false signals just because there's more activity on the market, especially it's uh, this is evident in lower time frames when you're like working on the hourly time frame or something. And then when the market is going crazy during like when the session is open, uh, then you might like get false signals if you don't adjust for volatility. volatility. Bollinger Bands adjust for volatility. Again, we won't do talk too much about that now because we don't have the time. You can we could create a whole separate webinar on that. But simply put, Bollinger bands are better than the envelope. And so what can we see here? We can see that the Bollinger bands, so this downward trend, which we're talking about here, like bum 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 up to here, and then it accelerates, right? It's always in the bottom band of the Bollinger bands, right? And here it actually crosses. Another thing you'll find is that when it actually crosses, then it kind of is likely to bounce off, right? So let's have a little couple of other examples. So here it's like it's all over the place, it's down, it's up. So that's kind of a flat. And that's that's another way. If you want to identify flats, then you just use the Bollinger bands. And um, you know, like you you simply put you're using the moving average, you're seeing if the indicator is crossing. But if you look at the Bollinger bands, you kind of like start try to uh, figure out when are they horizontal. So um, when is it moving like horizontally and you can use that to identify flats and personally flats are probably the hardest to identify they are the way you like I would prefer to look at them is they are the times of the market in between trends um, but other than that like channels are probably best to identify flats but point here is that um, if you're in an upward trend Let's have a look at an example or a downward trend. We've looked at a downward trend example. So for instance, for example, here, you've got an upward trend and you can see that the, the price is sitting in the uh, higher band of the Bollinger Bands, right? And when it does cross, when it does cross, that's when you're when there is risk of it going back. So it went back, okay, touched, then it went up, down, then it crossed. Okay, maybe it's gonna cross away all the way. The trend's gonna be over, no. Maybe the trend's gonna be over, no. Maybe the trend's gonna be over, no. And then here it crosses and the trend did end. So you can see that usually the trend completion of the trend is preceded by the Bollinger Bands crossing the band where it is sitting at. So, uh, for instance, here, good example again, Bollinger Band, cross, cross, uh, it's okay, cross. Okay, so it crossed a little bit, price closed above. Zoom in. You can see the price closed above, and then the trend ended. And so that's exactly what we're going to use. Uh, I'll show you now how to code this into your indicator, so into your expert advice. So we're going to pretend, if you're a man, by the way, if you're a manual trader, you can totally use this approach as well. So you're trading, say, for on the hourly time frame, you want to find out, all right, what's going on right now. So like, let's say right now, is this an upward trend or downward trend? And then I go to the Bollinger Bands and I can see that, uh, okay, so the Bollinger Bands just crossed into the bottom band. So looks like um, there was an upward trend uh, or like a bit again, it's not. It wasn't a complete upward trend because it looks like the Bollinger Bands was going down, and the price crossed into this bit, and now it's crossing back across this line. So basically, it looks like an uh, this bit of a trend is ending, and it looks like a downward trend is going to start somewhere here, um, and maybe you can check this later on further down in the week. 
but personally you don't have clear indication that it's a trend and what we're going to do now is we're going to quickly code we only have a few we don't have much time left but we're going to quickly code uh, this a rule into an in, into an expert advisor and i'll show you an example of how to do that it's actually it's actually pretty straight, straightforward the thing is the hardest thing is you need to identify the rule that you're going to code right and then it'll be easy so the rule that we want to code is we want to say when the price is below this middle line uh, but the price is above the bottom line we're going to say it's an upward trend a downward trend when the price is above the middle line but below the top line we're going to say that we're in an upward trend now you'll notice that this is not an ideal e example right you can see that here we're in a downward trend but the price is below here we're in a downward trend the price is below here we're in a downward trend but the price is below so there's a lot of times when our rule is not obeyed but it's not about specific times again this uh, like especially if you're programming expert advisors it's about statistically right so if you look at the number of bars you count the number of bars when you're in a downward trend and you're actually following obeying that rule when you're in between these two lines you'll see that is by far the majority of bars only a few bars actually go across this line or across this line in a downward trend we don't really care about them in our coding right because you can't code to account for every single situation you you got to account for the majority and as long as you get the majority right you know that's that's great if you filter out some if you get some uh what are called false positives no um false negatives in your um in your analysis you know it's not not a big not a big deal all right so let's get to the coding part um i've got uh, the meta editor open here and as as we discussed we're gonna be coding mcd sample right so open that up and let's save as and we're gonna save it as uh with bollinger bands so just say bb and what i'm going to show you here so i'm just going to switch back to the terminal here is the way we're going to check it is if you uh open up your expert advisor here so ba -bum -ba -bum. so actually let's just compile that quickly and so then it should show up here with bollinger bands just pick a period i picked the last three months visual mode and uh, so let's say m15 time frame um oh no optimization just start that in visual mode i just want to show you that the amount the number of trades no nope, bad idea put it on maximum speed so there you go so you can see that it's doing some trades and then if you look at the graph yes it's losing money what we're interested in is there's over 100 trades now let's see how many trades there'll be after we're done with it so we're going to scroll down to the bottom and this is how i like adding indicators into my expert advisors i'll say i'll add it as a separate function so that then i can use it as a filter All right so hopefully you can see this hopefully this is large enough actually maybe let's increase this to 18. and here i'm going to say int um let's say uh, something like along the lines of um bb signal or something like that like um where where uh, we're going to when, when are we going to allow our trade experimenter trade so we're going to say bb signal um allowed something along those lines and then we're just going to create a function it's going to be very quick and easy uh, we're going to first find out what was the close price on the previous bar close one equals i close and here we're going to pass the symbol uh, but here careful usually what we do is we pass the period and then we pass one because we want the first bar from the right but here instead of period we actually want to look at the entire time frame right so we're training on the 15 minute time frame but we want to look at the higher time frame so we'd say period d1 and we'd say double bb main that's our bollinger, man, uh, bollinger bands main and one means on the first bar and we'll say i bands again symbol uh time frame so period on uh, a period we want period d1 on the daily um uh, then what period of the bollinger bands we want we said we like 40 deviation two as you could see uh shift in the bands zero price which price we want to apply to we want to apply it to the close price and then we want to apply what uh what mode do we want so what line of the bollinger bands we want if you click f1 and you look here so 
applied price is that right no mode there mode so there we go so we got mode main that's the main line that's the one we want and then we've got mode upper mode lower so here we don't we want the main line mode main shift we want it on the first bar right so then you just copy this uh, and then we want here main we want upper and we want lower so here it's going to be very simple mode upper mode lower all right and that is us preparing so we're getting all the data that we want to analyze and now we're just going to analyze it. we're just going to say if very simple so we said if close one is greater than bb main so it's above the main line the middle line and so this stands for and the um double on percent remember it's double and close one so that same price is less than bb upper one then we are in an upward trend so we're going to return we're going to return a code our function is going to return a code plus one is going to be returned from here then we're going to say same thing we'll say else if now we're going to say if the close is actually below let's let's go back to the chart because it's been a while since we looked at it and might be forgetting uh so let's look at da -da -da -dum, here so we've just done this part was close one is above bb main close one is below upper so we did this condition so we're in this area above this main line below the second line top line but now we're going to say all right what happens if we're below the main line we have to be above the bottom line to be in this in this band right so we're going to say close one uh so else if don't forget the else and we're going to say close one is below bb main but at the same time close one is be above bb lower there it is lower one so in this case we're going to return minus one that's our code for remember we're turning an integer our code for hey we're in a downward trend and in the final situation we're just going to say else no condition uh we're just going to say else return zero so that's going to be in all other situations that's when for example when we're over here when we're on the line which is practically impossible statistically improbable um and then we're in, we're above the line and over here so in all those situations we're going to uh, just return nothing right so zero so that's our part just compile that oh oops compile compile that just make sure that everything is working fine so there's no errors all right and then you just take this bb signal allowed and then you just in your code you just look for order send so you can see there they are there's the two order sends and so there's our condition before the order send so you just add to that you say and what are we sending here order send we're opening a buy order boom so we want to say this equals to we're going to call our function we will say equals to one don't forget it's a double equal sign and then before our order send for a sell order we're going to say ba -bum, ba -bum, bum -bum. and this equals to minus one right or another way of doing it if you're lazy just say greater than one uh, greater whoa that was a close call right greater than zero that way you just you just have to correct one uh, symbol less than zero and, and it kind of like also um, is more intuitive in that way I think BB signal allowed greater, greater than zero less than zero compile voila and now if you go back here remember we had over a hundred orders and it was losing money um, dun, dun, dun. so now we've got that same expert advisor uh like nothing in the inputs changed because we didn't enter anything into, into the inputs but if we start this now and let's go to the end you can see that it was conducting orders but if i look at the results graph you can see that now it's only 44 orders right so this time a lot of the orders were filtered out why well because the bollinger bands were used as the filter as we created and added it into the code so over here and over here it's uh, checking and so you can um you now you can optimize the expert advisor you can take these and or these periods and put them into the expert properties and optimize them and see how you go another thing i wanted to mention is that here as well what you can do is you can make it more sophisticated right so with this bollinger bands we didn't we didn't look at is the price going up 
or down in the Bollinger Bands? Is it is like we we treated we treated um, we treated this situation. Let's have a look. We treated this situation when the price is going down in the Bollinger Bands the same as when it's going up in the Bollinger Bands. But obviously those are two different situations. So you can add a little layer of complexity by treating them separately and differently. Uh, but again, it's it's about how sophisticated you want to get. If you if this is already better than not having any filter. It could be better, again, how you optimize it. But basically what we learned today in terms of coding is that you can actually code, uh, call indicators from a higher period, from fear D1, even though we're trading on H1, or in this case on M15, we're calling an indicator from period D1. And that way you are getting more information that uh, is not evident on your chart. It's present on your chart because you're on a more granular time frame, but it's not evident. And therefore, uh, you might be missing it. And like this, you are filtering your entries based on a higher time frame. All right, so there we go. That's three indicators that we looked at to wrap up. We looked at uh, the MACD indicators. So we looked at the moving average. We slowly progressed from the moving average to two moving average to the MACD indicator. Then we also talked about using the MACD indicator in this very weird fashion, but which might be uh, useful. It tells us about the speed of the trend and how the speed of the trend is changing. So you can see it's a downward trend here, but the speed, there's something you can't see from here, you can see from here that the speed of the trend is actually slowing down. That might be an indication that the trend's about to turn around. Then we talked about the Fibonacci retracements, which you, we've already removed. We talked about them very briefly because we have a separate webinar in the Forex Trading, Forex Boat Trading Academy. So check that out on Fibonacci trade, um, indicators. And again, we mentioned that it is uh, an advantage of uh, advantage for manual traders, uh, which is very hard to re-implement or code for algorithmic traders. So if you're a manual trader, check out the Fibonacci indicators. I totally, totally adore them. Fibonacci, I think it's just a genius uh, invention. These, um, uh, these levels and these numbers, so much, inf so much interesting stuff um, follows these uh, Fibonacci numbers. And finally, towards the end, we talked about Bollinger Bands, using Bollinger Bands to identify um, when we are in a trend. Uh, also, oh, first of all, we talked about why Bollinger Bands are better than the envelope. Very obvious after you think about it and you compare the two. Then we talked about how to identify when you're inside a trend and uh, like um, to when to prepare. We also talked about when to prepare for a possible end of the trend or reversal of the trend or retracement. And also, finally, we talked about using higher time frames to filter your entries in lower time frames. So, for example, like with the Bollinger Bands. And finally, we put that all into code, which is over here. We put that all into code. So I gave you an example of how you create a separate, as you can see, I didn't adjust the code of the indicator much, right? I adjusted this. And then you just take this. What I usually do, you can see here, this is um, because in my other MediTrader 4 platform, you'll see I have lots of these with hashtags. You just copy this, and then you just have these functions. You see, I have a function. So for this, I would just uh, just create a new function, or I'll just, um, uh, I'll just save this one, save as, um, I'll just save it as E, B, signal, something like that, hashtag. And then I would just copy it in here, right? And that's it. I would save it. And whenever I want to add the BB signal into my expert advisor, my next, next expert advisor, I would just take it from here, take this whole code and go to my expert advisor like, like we did here, put it at the bottom, and then plug in this function wherever I need it. And that is a very quick way to adjust your expert advisors. And moreover, we also show how to call the higher period. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed this webinar. We've gone a bit over time, but nevertheless, uh, now I would like to take some questions. So let's jump back into um, uh, the question mode, all right? So I'm going to stop screen sharing. There we go. All right. So let's see what's been going on here. Uh, ba -bum. Uh, da, 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 da. This webinar is being recorded as always, um, and you need to have the uh, trader access level to be able to see the recordings. So uh, make sure you have that, and then you'll see all the webinar recordings, which which, um, which is very handy. Um, please do that on a future webinar. Super interesting, Thomas. Um, yeah, Thomas, you got. Please repeat what is super interesting. I, I'm sure there was a lot of super interesting stuff. What exactly were you talking about? Um, 
So it will the code be available later? Um, to be honest, there isn't that much code. Like I don't, I don't see the point of putting it in a separate, uh, a separate file, attaching it somewhere. Maybe, maybe if you ask Ruby really nicely in the Forex Boat Training Academy, she can put that code below the webinar in the webinar archive. I, th I think that can be done. Yeah, I, I think um, I'll send Ruby the code. She can put it in there for you if you want to copy it. No problem. Um, Alan, this chart window is clear, but other part, oh yeah, sorry if the webinar wasn't clear again. We've got people from all over the world. I, I've i got the best internet connection I can po possibly get in Australia. Uh, it's, it's nothing compared to the US. I was in the US, things download so quickly. This is the best I can get in Australia. So you really have to help me out and close all your other windows and, and try to um, get the better connection. If, if by some reason you can't, then you always come back to the replay and usually they're in good quality because we are recording in good quality so you can always check out the replay later um uh, thanks Kirill. watch the recording streaming not clear at all sorry about that um uh oh okay so thomas you were talking about bollinger band details um so okay so you would like to you know, have a bollinger bands webinar that'd be pretty cool i think yeah it's a pretty pretty interesting indicator all right, um, so if you have another question or something, type it in. Otherwise, we've gone over time. As we can see, that webinar was packed with lots of information. I'm going to just start my favorite poll here. How would you rate this webinar on a scale from 1 to 5, with 1 being the lowest, 5 being the highest? Let's go. Tell me tell me all of what you think, please. Um, it was one of those ad hoc webinars where not much preparation went into it, but let's see how we went. Uh, let's see what we got. All right, so we've got uh, eighty percent five stars, twenty percent four stars. Okay, sixty-seven, thirty-three. That's that's a good start. Just put your votes in. Put your votes in, guys. Let's see what you thought. And um, ho ho ho! And and pretty much everybody stayed. Wow, thank you guys. Thank you for sticking around that long. All right, so we got uh, seventy-eight percent five stars and twenty-two percent four stars. Thank you very much. That is that is great to hear. Glad you enjoyed it, and hope you picked up some interesting stuff from here. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to. Oh, there we go, Eros. That's that's who I was thinking about. Who's coding a lot and putting it out. Kudos to you, Eros and uh, El Elia. I think how I'm pronouncing the name right for putting out code in the Forex Boat uh, Club. Uh, keep doing that, and yeah, it would be great if you can code the. Uh, super smoother into a super smoother conversion divergence indicator. That'd be really cool. Anyway, hopefully you guys picked up a lot of useful information. See how that stuff can be applied to your trading. Maybe, uh, obviously, take care. Don't jump into it. Um, you know, See what your preferences are. But I think there was quite some interesting stuff for both manual and algo traders in that webinar. And I look forward to seeing you next time. As always, happy trading. I'll see you when I get back. Take care. See you guys.